On the 12th of January, 2018, a paranoid man sits in his living room, struggling to keep a grasp on reality. Upstairs are two women, waiting for one of their boyfriends to arrive. The voices in the man's head convince him that the women are conspiring to kill him. He decides to act first resulting in the brutal bludgeoning and stabbing of Haley Sue Green. She had done nothing to deserve this. In this episode, we will be looking at a letter from the assailant Mark Ahrens, where he speaks candidly about the build-up to the crime, but also gives his first-hand account of his psychosis and actions as the horrific events took place. There is next to no information on this case, so I have to stress that what is said in this letter are Aaron's version of events. This is the house where the murder took place. When police arrived, they found Haley Sue Green with multiple stab wounds. She died at the scene. Aaron's had disappeared, but while officers were at the crime scene, a burglary was reported just a few blocks away. This is where they found Aaron, hiding in the yard. He resisted arrest and punched an officer, but he was eventually taken into custody. Before we get to the letter, I want to say thank you to a true crime artist known as Modified Mermaid, who has kindly donated this letter from his personal collection. They also have an Instagram account where you can see their work and also commission some for yourself. So please go check out their page called Modified Mermaid. Links are also in the description. Firstly, just look at the letter from a physical standpoint The handwriting seems chaotic and aggressive. It's also a constant stream. You get the sense the words are just flowing out of him and they are holding no punches. My name is Mark Christopher Ahrens. I'm 35 years old. I've been locked up for a little over three years, doing a 45 year sentence for what my lawyer said was the most brutal murder he's ever seen. My buddy, Eddie Ray, told me a little bit about you and said it would be cool to write you. He said you were into the devil and this is what got me writing. I'm very much into Satan and witchcraft. However, I know almost nothing on the subjects. All I know is I'm a puppet in the show. I'd love to know more. It doesn't sound great coming from someone who committed such a heinous murder, wanting to get into witchcraft and Satanism, it says to me that it's probably still on a dark path. I'll tell you a little about myself and how I wound up in prison. When I was a kid, we moved around a lot, like every couple of years. Both my parents have been married six times and counting. When I was 12, I started using drugs, meth, coke, weed, pills and drinking. I also started getting into trouble with the law. I went to juvenile hall and group homes and shit like that. Anyway, I've always been different. I see shit differently and feel differently about the shit I see. So in my 20s, I wound up in a town called Jamestown. It's in California. That's where I'm from, California. The town was really fucking cool is a small gold mining town in the middle of the mountains. It sounds like he was neglected as a child, doing drugs at a very young age. Juvenile prison. It's obviously not an excuse, but it could be a reason for his psychosis later in life. Almost everybody there is on dope and into weird shit. It's a town full of meth and witches. I loved it. There's a casino there, a very small one in the middle of nowhere called Chicken Ranch. It's very cool. I miss it. Well, I didn't have a job while I lived there. I just did drugs, sold drugs, maybe did an odd job here and there, 
stayed with friends or just slept where I passed out. It was awesome. Maybe he thought everybody was on dope because that's the world he lived in. I mean, if you're on the streets selling drugs, then there's only a certain kind of person you're gonna meet. I had a dog named Bender, who was my best friend and always with me, unless I was at the casino or in jail. I truly love that dog. What happened to him is probably worse than why I'm in prison. Now, if you're curious, I'll tell you the story one of these days. It's gruesome. I've not even heard this story. I just feel bad for the dog. I started hearing people talking in my head when I was about 18. Male and female. It was weird. When I was in Jamestown, I was hearing them all the time. Not only hearing them, but having some powerful experiences with weird shit. Seeing ghosts, seeing weird signs, having outer body experiences, meeting strange people and having strange shit happen. However, the voices were always talking to me and about me. They were always clear, they weren't always friendly, but they were constant. Let me get down to it. I'm starting to feel like I'm rambling. I got in a fight that got a little out of hand and ended up in the hospital with blood all over my brain, cracked skull, broken nose, stitches and staples. My dad was in Texas with wife number six, heard about what happened and came to California to get me. I think I had just turned 30. Let me take a little break, my hands cramping up. All right. Now I'm in Texas, I get a job painting houses. My dad tells me I have a little inheritance money, but I have to buy a house with it. So I buy a fucking house. Well, I get back to doing drugs, meth, pills, and even a little heroin. I lose my painting job, but get a job cleaning restaurants at night. It's cool, but not really paying the bills. I'm buying drugs off this dude who's saying he knows a couple of girls who sell dope and need a place to stay. He sees I've got an extra room. I say, hell yeah, sounds good. Well, a few days later, it's like two in the morning, there's a knock at the door. A fucking smoking hot chick and two trucks loaded with shit. The dudes driving the trucks are bad looking dudes. Prison tats all over. I got a small two bedroom house. After unloading the trucks, they say they're gonna go get more. I tell them there's no room. The girl says please. She'll find storage for all the stuff, but she needs to move it out of where it's at. She gives me a bunch of dope. I say okay. Okay, so there's been a few points in this story now where most people would have stopped. But I feel now that he has just accepted drugs as payment for use of his house. He now only has himself to blame for the situation that he finds himself in. This is the point of no return. Anyway, it's been like three days. My house is full of shit. People coming and going all fucking day and night of course. I find out her boyfriend is high up in a prison gang in jail and should be out any day. Just my luck. Well, my boss calls me and says we got a job to do. It's out of town. My boss starts tripping me out the whole ride there. Shit, it's getting weird. We get to the job, I'm smoking a cigarette outside and the cops pull up. They start giving me a hard time and end up arresting me for under the influence and resisting arrest. It was bullshit. It was like mid-November. My bail was only $200 and my fucking dad wouldn't get me out. I didn't have anyone else's number. I spent about 50 days in that fucking jail. Thanksgiving and Christmas, even New Year's. When I finally went to court, they fucking dropped the charges and let me go. Motherfuckers. There seems to be a convenient lack of information. He was probably under the influence and acting out of line. I know nothing more than you do, but you don't just go to jail for nothing. I get home and this fucking bitch has taken over my house. She's moved into my room and has her own roommate. And of course, her boyfriend's out and with her. 
They said they didn't know what happened to me. They even filled out a missing person report. Anyway, I tell them it's not gonna work. But, oh yeah, all my shit gone. My clothes, everything. I go to a friend's house. He tells me I better look out. Her boyfriend is responsible for a shitload of murders and he doubts they're just gonna move out. Well, a couple of days later, they move most of their shit out. I even help them unload the trucks. Her boyfriend and his friends are giving me some bad looks. Once they're gone, I realize they stole my phone, took all the food and left two little puppies. These puppies are fucking pissing and shitting all over my house. But it's like five degrees outside and raining. I can't put them outside. Her boyfriend comes over, all puffed up, telling me I'd better not throw any of the shit they left. He'll be back later to get it. I say, cool, take these fucking dogs. He says he'll be back later to get them. He doesn't know what happened to my phone. Well, days go by, I haven't eaten very much. I haven't slept very much. These fucking puppies are driving me insane. Haven't fed them, but they're fucking shitting and pissing everywhere. It's not good. I'm starting to hear voices. I know that is in a hell of a predicament right now, but I just feel sorry for those dogs. Feed them, take them for a walk, just leave the dogs out of it. I don't ever write long letters. I don't really talk to anyone. So I don't know if I'm expressing how fucking stressed out and disrespected I'm feeling at this point in the story. But it's bad. Okay, so it's been days. My roommate and her friend show up, both hot chicks. Well, they say they're just waiting for her boyfriend to show up with his friend to take care of the shit that's left. They go in one of the rooms and lay down on the bed. I can hear her talking on the phone, saying shit like, yeah, he's here, he's in the living room. And all of a sudden, my head snaps. I hear a bunch of people, male and female in my head. They're crystal clear. They say, Mark, turn the radio down. I do. They thank me and say that's better. They take turns in saying hi. They tell me they love me and they've been watching me for a long time. I say hi back. We're having a conversation. It's blowing my mind how real and clear it is. It's awesome. It's all very positive. Well, they say they'd like to welcome me to the family. We're a murdering family. And one of the girls in the house has to die tonight. They say they're on a time limit. That this is my moment. It's my choice. Like I said earlier, this is his version of events. But if this is true, then he is in a deep psychosis. And obviously, he's got no real idea of what's happening. He said the voices were a good vibe, while at the same time, they were calling themselves the murder family. Wow. Well, I look around the house for some type of murder weapon. I see a brass owl on the table, about the size of a roll of toilet paper. It's heavy. I pick it up walk in the room and start hitting Haley on the head hard as I can. She falls on the floor in between the bed and the nightstand. I don't know where it came from but on the nightstand I see a big hunting knife. I say thank you. I pick it up and start stabbing her in the head and face. Also the neck but I don't remember stabbing her neck but they called it a severed head. You know, barely attached, 34 stab wounds. I remember sitting down on the nightstand, watching take what I assume is her last breath, thinking, well, if that didn't kill her, I don't know what will. So her friend ran out the house and left the front door open. I closed it and went out on the back porch to smoke a cigarette and tell the voices, how was that? They were shocked. They say, stay calm. They say, cops were on the way. And to do what they said. They told me when to run, when to hide, what fences to hop. While I was hiding by a fence, two shadow beings came to see me. They were about five feet away. 
They didn't say anything. They just knelt down and were looking at me. After that shit, I got a little weird. I hopped a few more fences, hid in someone's garage for a bit, but then, I hate to admit it, but I kinda started to panic. I was crawling under a car and almost got stuck. So I said fuck and just started walking down the sidewalk. Bad idea. Cops came out of nowhere and tackled me down. Beat the fucking shit out of me. Hogtied me and threw me in the back of a cop car. That's brutal, isn't it? I'm also not sure what to believe. As I mentioned earlier, the news reports said that Aaron went to the house, whereas he says two women turned up at the house. Is it to slight them? To say that they are involved in that world? Or is he just saying the hard truth? Maybe he genuinely doesn't know, because by his own admission, he's in a deep psychosis at this point. This happened January 12, 2018, at 107 North Fairmount, Amarillo, Texas. However, I wasn't booked into the Potter County Jail until January 14th. During this in-between time, some crazy sh** happened. Before taking me to jail, the cops pulled over and beat me bad, then took me to the hospital. At the hospital, they took me in a room and while I was handcuffed and in a daze, kept injecting my wrists with something weird. I swear it almost killed me. The cop kept telling the nurse, give him more. Now all of a sudden, I'm full blown hallucinating. They take me to jail. I'm in the holding cell, but I'm in another world. Witches come to see me. Demons want to talk and show their respects. There's an owl who tells me he's my great, 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 greatest grandfather. He saw what happened and just wants to check on me. The jail staff keeps running the team on me all night and the whole next day. They finally take my mugshot picture. They haven't given me any water since this happened. I look like shit. The nurse comes to see me and says take him to the hospital right now. They make me. I'm there for the next three days. I got a broken hand, nerve damage in my leg, and still to this day, scars on my wrists. Deep ones from their handcuffs. By the time I get back to jail, I got so many death threats, they came and asked me if I wanted to go into protective custody. They said they couldn't put me in general population. I said, all right, sign the papers, and that was it. Caught 45 years. Been in prison ever since. It's just such a waste of life, isn't it? The guy is clearly mentally ill and there doesn't seem to be any motive for the killing. Just he was in a bad mental state and did something horrendous. And Haley was in the wrong place at the wrong time and she lost her life because of it. Tragic. So look, this is the longest letter I ever wrote in my life. I don't really ever talk to people, but lately I've been thinking it might be nice to have a friend or someone to talk to every now and then. Especially someone who's not a Christian. Fuck Jesus. I tell these people all the time, if Eve never ate that apple, people would be walking around fucking their brothers and sisters. Fuck the Garden of Eden and fuck being a sheep. Anyway, like I said, I know almost nothing about Satan or witchcraft type of stuff. I'm hoping you might educate me a bit. Also, I'm trying to draw and would love some pictures on the subjects. Alright man, I hope you enjoy this letter and I hope to hear back from you. Mark Aaron. So one thing that's clear is that Aaron does not seem to show any remorse whatsoever for his actions and seems to just want to race further down a dark path. It raises the question of how much of this psychosis is true. Is it just a way for him to justify his actions? If it is true, then why does he still want to go down this dark path now? He ended the letter with this poem, which I think sums up his psyche. Oh yeah, I write poems every now and then. They're not good, but I have fun doing it. Here's one. You won't find footprints on the right track. Sanity is something I lack. 
but my horns are growing without a crack. So I'll rip your guts out for a snack. Then barf them up and give them back. The devil's in me and that's a fact. This case is a tragic waste of human life. A seemingly pointless murder. And in this letter at least, it appears that Aaron is incapable of feeling remorse or understanding the devastation of his actions. I doubt he is likely to change. Until next time, stay sane.